Let us join our voices together in the call to worship. We come to hear the story of God's faithfulness to past generations, but we also look to the future as well as the past. The God who was with our ancestors is with us as well. We can go forward in hope. Whatever else fails, God remains faithful. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Praise be to God. Let us pray. We gather this day to give thanks and praise to the Creator, the one who has painted the landscape in shades of red, yellow, and orange, who has brought the harvest to maturity, who causes sun and moon to run their courses daily. We come to worship the one who has created us and loves us beyond measure. We come to worship our faithful God, the weak and the strong, the fearful and the restless, we come. We come in gratitude for the forgiveness and mercy God offers us freely. We come to be encouraged, to be renewed, and we come to seek to grow as disciples of Christ. We pray, Almighty God, that you will empower and guide us as we seek to shine the light of your love in the world. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our opening hymn is All Creatures of Our God and King, number 455. Please stand as you are able.
We gather as God's people, knowing that while we try to follow as disciples of Jesus, we have done so imperfectly. Each of us has sinned against God and against one another. Yet trusting in God's mercy and grace, let us offer to God the truth of our lives as we confess our sins in our innocent prayer of confession. Holy God, hear our prayer. Sometimes our lives are a mess because of choices we have made or because of choices others have made. Sometimes our lives are great and we're kind and generous. Sometimes our lives are great and we forget to be grateful and humble. We trust that in the jungle of all this, you are present. We trust that you are with us, walking with us when we stray, nudging us back to the right path, slowing us down when we get ahead of you, and waiting for us when we lie on earth. So we thank you and ask for your forgiveness and pray that you will stay with us throughout the Merciful God, hear us now as we each offer our own silent prayer of confession. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Friends, God sent his son Jesus not to judge us, but to save us. God accepts our doubts, our fears. God accepts our sincere confession and prayers for renewal. I declare to you that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, our sins have been forgiven. Accept God's forgiveness and the gift of a new beginning. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us stand together for the glory. How are you guys today? Did you all have chocolate donuts for breakfast? I'm going to come to your house for breakfast. <laughs> Why don't you step over this way just a little bit? What have I got here? Uh, you guys like apples? Yeah. Yeah. But let's do some math. How many apples do I have? Mm -hmm. How many of us are there here? Three, four. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's right. This, this stuff's right here. So how can I make one apple that we can all have a piece of this apple? Put it in uh, four pieces. Right. We, and what do, we, what do we call that when you divide something up like that and you keep it to one another? Sharing. <laughs> that's right. We're going to share with one another. Because we have one apple, and we want everybody to have a piece of the apple, don't we? Mm -hmm. And this apple comes from a tree that God created, and somebody picked and brought to the grocery store, and then I took it home. But one of the things we learn from the Bible is that God teaches us that we need to share with one another. That if we have enough of something, if we have two apples or ten apples, if we have enough of something, we should share it with others who don't have enough. And Luke, there's a passage that says, if you have two shirts, give one to somebody who needs it. Also, if there's somebody that's hungry, you should feed them. So there's a strong 
um, theme of sharing in the Bible, sharing with people we know and sharing with people who need help. So when we have enough clothes or food or money, we should be grateful and thankful to God for those blessings and we should try and share what we have. Now yesterday we had an event here at the church where we have the coat closets usually in the basement. If you go in fellowship hall today, you'll see all those coats and hats and gloves and boots and everything were brought upstairs. We have a lot of people in this community who bring us their coats when they don't fit or when their kids outgrow them, and we're able to share them with other people. As I said earlier, we had 25 families came and got some warm coats. What were you going to say? Yeah. So we had lots of people who went home because it's going to be cold this next week. They're going to be a little warmer, and some kids at school are going to have a nice coat to wear. But sometimes, if we have only one apple, it's not always easy to share. Because if we really like apples, we might want to eat the whole thing ourselves, might we? Mm -hmm. But God said, no, if you have enough, you should share. And so when you listen to the story today, especially the story from Mark about the loaves and the fishes, somebody shared what they had, and lots of people benefited by having enough to eat. So I want you to think about that and think about, I know it's not always easy to share, but that we want to try and when God has blessed us with enough, whether it's apples or books or coats, that if there's things we can share, we should share with other people. Let's do a popcorn prayer today. I'll, I'll say a word, say the verse or whatever you repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God thank, you thank you for the many things you give us. For the many things you give us. Help us to share with one another what you have given us. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you later. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Almighty God, as we hear your word, may our hearts and ears be open to receive your instruction. May our hands and feet respond as your instruments of love and grace. And may we ever offer our thanks and praise for your graciousness to each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Old Testament reading is Malachi chapter 3, verses 6 through 12. Listen to God's word. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be not room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Thank you, Candice. Our New Testament reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, beginning at verse 30 and going to verse 44. The familiar story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. And that because so many people were coming and going, that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, 
come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them weeping recognized them and ran out on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, they said. It's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus answered, You give them something to eat. They said to him, That would take more than a half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? He asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of fifties and hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. Jesus gave thanks and broke the loaves. And then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them. They all ate and all were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was five thousand. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Thank you God. God. I have a question for you today. Are you in? Are you in? Are you invited? Are you inspired? Are you involved and invested as a disciple of Jesus Christ? Jesus invited his disciples to follow him, to live with him and learn from him. We are also invited into discipleship. The goal of discipleship in Jesus' day and still today is to be like our teacher. A disciple of Christ was to be invested body and soul in following their teacher. One's character, as well as their thinking, was to be shaped by their teacher. The first disciples were inspired by Christ's life, his teachings, his healings, and his miracles, like the one we read of today, feeding the 5,000. Just prior to this gospel account is the account of how Jesus sent the disciples out to the villages and towns two by two, giving them the authority over unclean spirits. And the scripture says they cast out many demons and they anointed the sick and many people were healed. Jesus had lived with and taught his disciples for three years. He involved them in many types of missions. The Great Commission was the last one he gave them directly. When Jesus said, go and make disciples of all the nations, <clears throat> baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. We participate in that mission as members of this congregation. Like the first disciples, each of us are invited by Christ into fellowship, into worship, into service. We are inspired by Christ's life and death, and our lives should reflect what we have learned from Christ. So how are you responding to Christ's invitation, Christ's inspiration, to be involved and invested in a life of discipleship, in, a li in the life of this congregation? Are you hesitant to be involved? Are you luke lukewarm in your practice of faith, not recognizing perhaps how one might be drifting away from God, allowing other things to take priority in your life? In our Old Testament reading, the prophet Malachi was addressing people who were drifting away from God. The Israelites had returned to Jerusalem after being captives in Babylon, and the years of getting resettled had been hard, and yet it was the prophecy of the coming Messiah that helped ease the challenge. Yet after more of 70 years of waiting for that Messiah, the people's enthusiasm had waned. Even the religious leaders had become lukewarm and were drifting from God. 
The religious leaders and the people had neglected their ministry. The people weren't invested in their relationship with God. And the prophet called them out for their lukewarm response. Malachi recounts the people were no longer offering their best to God. Instead, they were offering what they didn't want, which included blind and crippled animals, which fell short of God's request for the first fruits and the best of any harvest or crop. And the people were doubting the significance of God in their lives. Their actions, the way they responded to God, were evidence of the low priority they gave to their relationship with God. The people were being self-centered. They were keeping their wealth to themselves rather than saying thank you to, thank you to God with their tithes and offerings. They were, as Malachi said, shortchanging or robbing God. An elderly master carpenter was ready to retire. He told his employer of his plans to leave the house building business and live a more leisurely life, leisurely life with his wife and enjoying his extended family. Granted, he would miss the paycheck, but he was ready to retire. Now the contractor was really sorry to see this master carpenter, this good worker, retire. And he asked him if he would build just one more house as a personal favor. And the master carpenter said yes, but it didn't take long to see that his heart just wasn't in his work. The carpenter resorted to shoddy workmanship. He used inferior materials. It was an unfortunate way to end a good career. And when the carpenter had finished his work and the builder came to inspect the house, the contractor handed the front door key to the carpenter, saying, This is your house. It is my gift to you. How do you suppose that carpenter felt in that moment? After receiving the key to the house, did he feel excited, embarrassed, sad, angry? The carpenter was a steward of this project. His employer had trusted him with the materials and knowing of his abilities. Yet the carpenter had robbed his employer. He had drifted away from the best practices. He hadn't used his best workmanship for the best materials. In shortcutting the job and his employer, the carpenter missed the blessing he also could have received. Are we guilty of robbing God? Are we guilty of trying to shortcut what should really be God? God challenged the people, saying, they were robbing God. The people seemed to have forgotten the words of Psalm 24. The earth and everything on it, including the people, belong to the Lord. The world and its people belong to him. Giving is a way to honor God. God wants the best for each of us. God promised the Israelites if they would put their relationship with God right, God would throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing the storehouses couldn't hold it. The people were being asked, invited, to reconsider their relationship with God, to be inspired by recalling how God had been present with their ancestors in the wilderness, recalling the story of the manna and the quail. God's blessings would come when the people were involved and invested in their relationship with God and their faith community. Maybe we don't so much identify with Malachi's community, but perhaps we can identify with the disciples in the gospel story. How do we see the ministry of our church? Is it through a lens of scarcity or through a lens of possibility? The disciples offered a number of reasons, many of which were valid, about the challenges of feeding this big crowd of people. We can't feed all these people. Where do we have it? We can't have enough money to buy bread for everyone. Prices are high, bread and fish are in short supply. You want us to use all of our money to do this one big meal? Jesus, we're just a tiny band of fishermen. We don't have enough people to feed all of these people. We don't even have a secretary. We can't feed these people, Jesus. We don't have the energy for one more thing. Any of those sound familiar? Do we raise similar concerns about and questions when we think about meeting a need doing a new project, doing something new as a congregation? 
Our reaction to what God asks of us is often to think of all the reasons we can't do something. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough people. We don't have enough young people. We don't have enough energy. These kind of obstacles are real, and they must be addressed. But the disciples look through a lens of scarcity, saying we don't have enough. We can't possibly do more or give more. They couldn't see possibilities. Jesus, however, saw possibilities when he asked them, how many loaves do you have? They had to go and find out. And when they found out, they found they had enough. Jesus invited the disciples to be involved in the feeding of the 5,000. They assessed the resources and then passed out the baskets of bread and fish and then gathered up the fragments. This involvement led them to be more inspired and invested in Jesus' ministry and teaching. And in time, the disciples did take the gospel to the ends of the earth, and it continues to be shared around the world today. So Jesus would have us first consider what we do have before, what, before we consider whether or not we can do something. How might what you have and who you have be used to address the need that's raised up? For example, the food pantry and backpack programs both have been strengthened by volunteers from Wayne State College who assist us not only in putting together backpacks and delivering them, as well as helping us keep our inventory of pantry boxes easily accessible. And likewise, the deacons were blessed by the assistance of the students from the school and the FCCLA club and their sponsor, Mrs. Server, and Christine Dutcher, the Spanish instructor, and some of her students on Saturday who assisted at the coat giveaway, who helped us move things, who helped in Spanish translation, as well as all of those people who donated coats and accessories that we were able to pass on to people. We have resources that we often overlook. We need to look for possibilities. We need to look for partners. What can we do? What can you imagine that we can do together? Today you received your current statement of giving. Will you be like the Israelites and withhold your resources rather than honor God with your best? Will you be like the disciples, looking through a lens of scarcity, saying, I'll give you or give more? Or will you be inspired by Christ and consider what you do have to share? Even a little can make a big difference. You know those five loaves and two fish fed 5,000 people. And each of us has more resources than bread and fish. God appointed humanity to be stewards of God's property. We are the caretakers of all creation. We are the caretakers of one another. Our response to God's generosity should be overflowing gratitude. Christian stewardship is really nothing less than what we do with all we have, our skills, our abilities, our interests, and other resources, which includes our financial resources. And money, that's a subject the Bible has a lot to say about. Someone has taken the time to calculate that the Bible has some 500 verses on prayer, 500 verses on faith, but more than 2,000 verses about money and possessions. Jesus talked a lot about money. But much of Jesus' focus wasn't on wealth, per se, but our relationship with material goods and money. Remember the story of the rich young ruler from Mark's Gospel who came to Jesus asking how to inherit eternal life? The man was devout and faithful. He had kept all the commandments from his youth, he told Jesus. Jesus said to him, go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and then come follow me. The scriptures tell us the man went away grieving, for he owned much property. It can be hard to keep our priorities in order. We're all concerned about feeling secure, yet ultimately our security isn't in material or financial wealth, but in God. As First Timothy reminds us, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. So over these next weeks, I hope you will spend some time prayerfully considering the ways you can show your commitment to God. 
how you can deepen your relationship. Perhaps how you can invite others to be inspired by the Christ that you know, to be involved and invested in this faith community, to volunteer to help with the food pantry or co club or, or suggest new ideas to the session. Each of us play a role in the life of this congregation. We're all a part of this body and can contribute to its growth and health or to its decline. Let us not be like the Israelites who drifted from God and lost their focus. We're like the disciples who look through a lens of scarcity, but rather a lens of possibility, as Jesus did. Author Anthony DeMello writes, Those who expect God to be generous with them must be generous with their fellows. Give, says Jesus, and gifts will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be pouring out in your lap. For whatever measure you deal out to others will be dealt out to you in return. If you are tight-fisted and calculating with the poor, the needy, with those who ask you for help and service, how can you expect God to be generous with you? Sounds very much like Malachi's word of God wanting to open up the store gates if we improve our relationship with God. God can do with do miracles with what whatever we offer in thanks and gratitude. <clears throat> Jesus invited his disciples to follow him. We have received the same invitation. Are you inspired by Christ's action in the world and desire to grow as a disciple? Are you invested in the future of this congregation and its ministries here in Wayne, as well as the ways denominationally you can reach around the world? Are you involved in the life of this congregation, sharing your resources and participating in various types of service, acting as a deacon or an elder, volunteering as a greeter or a lector or a fellowship host? Are you willing to share how God has been at work in your life? If your answer to all these questions is yes, then you're in. Thanks be to our triune God for the many ways we can respond to Christ's invitation, be inspired, invested, and involved as disciples, making a difference in this community and around the world. Hallelujah. Amen. Our hymn of response is printed, the words are printed in your bulletin. The tune is a familiar one, Nettleton. I encourage you to stand as you are able and let us sing together.
Let us go to God in time of prayer. <laughs> Trying God in the changing of the seasons, the gathering in of the harvest, we see again the rhythm and order you have created in the natural world. And while we humans plant and till, till the land and plant the seed, it is by your hand that growth is given. And we give thanks for the growth that was, which sustains us in so many ways. This day we are reminded, O oh God, of our role as stewards of all you have created. You have asked us to care for the earth and one another, and we pray for your guidance in the work that you've called us to do. We give thanks for the many blessings we each experience, family, friends, homes, vocations, which allow us security and many benefits. And we give thanks for the talents and abilities you have given each one of us. And yet, let us not forget, God, that you ask us, that you challenge us to share generously with one another. We lift up in prayer this day those who are unable to worship with us due to health concerns or distance. We pray for those undergoing treatment for disease or awaiting surgery. You know, great healer, what each one needs. Grant them healing, whether mental or physical or spiritual. We pray for all those who work in the medical field that they might be your hands and feet, aiding many to restore health. Merciful God, there are many this day who are grieving and in pain. Grant them, O oh God, strength, guide them. May they feel your loving embrace that gives them comfort. O oh God, it has been a difficult year for many and in many different ways. We've been impacted, many have been impacted by severe weather, wildfires, floods, and other natural disasters. We pray for all those whose lives have been disrupted by storms or disasters. We pray for their strength to face the days of rebuilding. And we give thanks for all those who are working in disaster areas to assist in rebuilding and restoring people and their homes, whether it's from feeding them or working on an electric grid or cleaning up garbage. We give thanks for the hands that are at work there. And we pray this day, Almighty God, for our national and world leaders, that they might be given wisdom to deal with the many challenging issues in the world today. <clears throat> the war of Ukraine, famine, drought, fire, and storms around the world. We pray for all those who have been displaced by war, violence, and hunger. We pray, Almighty God, for the world that you created and love so much. We pray that we might find a way to live together in peace. Precious God, attune our ears to your voice, that we might discern your call to us, that we might continue to be faithful in sharing your good news, encouraging new expressions of faithfulness, that our community might grow with others who also desire to know you and share this journey with us. Greater God, I pray your spirit might fall upon this congregation, Help us to share the comfort and joy we found in our relationship with you and one another. Make us bold yet compassionate as we step out in faith, that our lives might be illuminating, illuminated by your love, which overflows to those around us. And together we pray as Jesus has taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, I love thee thy kingdom, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. All that we have, all that we are, comes from the gift of God. It is right that we should return to God's service a portion of our labors. The offering box is at the rear of the sanctuary. Let us stand together for the God's offering. <laughs> Pray that these gifts might be used in ways that please and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen. A closing hymn is called as Partners in Christ's Service, number 343. Thank you. 